It's wonderful to be with you again. I'm delighted. Uh, for those who may not know, October 31st of 2017, just about seven months ago, it marked the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. It made big news back then, <clears throat> maybe not in the Catholic circles, but it was a big event around the world. <clears throat> so for that reason, I thought I'd focus the myths about the Catholic Church old and new on many of the myths that surrounded people like uh, Martin Luther, John Calvin, and the Protestant Reformation. According to the popular story, 500 years ago, on October 31st, 1517, an Augustinian monk named Martin Luther nailed to the church door of the Wittenberg Castle Church 95 theses. And from that moment on, this fairly obscure university professor was known only to his family, his friends, to his fellow monks, and to his academic colleagues. He now became one of the most famous people in history. One biographer, Martin Luther, boasted, in most big libraries, books by and about Martin Luther occupy, occupy more space on the shelves than those concerned with any other human being except Jesus Christ. Despite the tremendous amount of scholarship de dedicated to Martin Luther, a false narrative perpetuated first by the post-Reformation propaganda, it really obscures the real man. I was telling a couple down here earlier that, you know, when it comes to looking at anybody in history, like ourselves, you're going to see good and bad. It's almost like an Olympic scoring and diving. You throw out the high mark and the low mark, and you get kind of the, the right mark, huh? There's a proper way to look at somebody. But there's a lot of false narrative about this man, that he was this valiant monk fighting against the, the powerful papacy, papacy, papacy excuse me, in order to reform the corrupt church of the 16th century. He was attacked by the Catholic Church for his heroic defense of the average Catholic, desiring to bring purity back to the faith. And ultimately, he was forced into this decision to cause the Protestant Reformation and the revolution that followed. And many other myths have kind of come from that narrative. Perhaps the one that illustrates the false image of this heroic monk standing alone against the powerful Catholic Church is his supposed famous quote at the Diet of Worms in 1521, when the defiant Martha Luther told the Catholic Roman Emperor, Charles V, after refusing to recant his heretical teachings, here I stand, I can do no other. The only problem is he didn't say those words. Those were words that were put into his mouth by biographers many decades later. So through the centuries, it's, it's kind of been difficult to discern fact from fiction in the case of Martin Luther. Again, much of the narrative about Martin Luther is that he was a bold reformer. But the real story is that he was a bright, complex, troubled man whose rejection of papal authority, among other heretical positions, quickly ushered in a revolution and not a reformation, which ended up literally dividing Christendom and, in many ways, in a sad way, has shaped Western civilization down to the modern day. So as the religious and even the secular media recalled the event just seven months ago, this 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, well, many of the myths about Martin Luther and the Reformation came back up to the surface, and that's why I wanted to address them. Some of those myths are that the Protestant Reformation was necessary and inevitable because the Catholic Church had become so corrupted, literally corrupted to its core by immorality, and false doctrines. The Catholic Church sold indulgences and ecclesiastical offices, and these abuses led to the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther and other reformers were the first to translate Scripture into the vernacular languages, which the Church had previously forbidden. Another myth, the reformers were holy men who struggled heroically to free the true Christian faith from the superstitions of Rome. After freeing the Europe from the clutches of the Catholic Church, the Protestant Reformation inaugurated an era of great peace and prosperity. 
modernity and all its blessings are a direct result of the Protestant Reformation. For the Reformation gave birth to a unique work ethic that spawned capitalism, thus ushering many blessings in the modern world. Well, tonight we're going to cover the first four of those myths, and then next week we're going to touch on the last two. But before we begin, I believe it would be really helpful if we would review briefly the life of Martin Luther and the world in which he lived. Martin Luther was born to Hans and Margarita Luther on November 10th, 1480. He was the firstborn son. He was baptized the very next day, which, if you know in your liturgical calendar, is the feast of St. Martin of Tours. And hence, he was baptized, given the name of that great 4th century soldier, Roman soldier turned Christian. Now, according to Roland Betine's biography, <clears throat> Here I Stand, Martin Luther was a self-absorbed, complex, and very troubled individual who would have been a troubled spirit even in a tranquil time. In the 16th century, certainly wasn't that. Martin Luther had a, a con deep conversion experience in the year 1505. What caused that? He was almost struck by a lightning bolt, almost died as a result of it. And that so shook him that he decided to enter the Augustinian monastery in uh, Erfurt instead of going into the law school that his father wanted him to do. Also, Martin Luther, if you know his history, he was a very scrupulous man. He, he went to confession frequently in the monastery. He struggled with many, many uh, spiritual issues, but especially he struggled with the issue of the knowledge of salvation. In spite, of, in, in spite of his incredible monastic life with all the penances and prayer, Luther doubted whether or not he was really justified in the eyes of God, whether he'd ever be saved. Why was this? Well, because he had a very negative view of God. For Luther, God was this very strict and wrathful judge who desired to punish sinners, just looking for you to mess up so he could send you to hell. You know, Dr. Ken Hensley uh, gave a marvelous presentation earlier in the university series on the true story of Martin Luther. If you didn't make that talk, I suggest you purchase his series from the uh, Lighthouse Productions. It's a brilliant series. But Dr. Hensley states that Martin Luther had a terrible relationship with his parents, most especially his father, who was very, very abusive to him. He could never please his father. And Dr. Hensley proposes that and believes that Martin Luther, what he did was project this abusive experience of his own earthly father upon that of his heavenly father. He really believed there was nothing he could do to please God. And hence, Martin Luther lived in dread fear of losing salvation. And that fear would literally color most of his life and a lot of his teachings. The fact was that Martin Luther was a very bright man. He eventually was sent to the University of Wittenberg to teach. And from his research on the letters of St. Paul, what happened is he slowly he began to develop what became the bedrock of Protestant theological doctrine, sola fide, which means in your Latin, faith alone. A belief that faith alone, apart from any work, justifies a sinner. Then later he adopted another of the bedrock pillars of uh, theology of Protestantism, sola scriptura. The only authoritative source of God's divine revelation is scripture. By the way, that was a heretical notion that was developed by the proto-Protestants, John Wycliffe and Jan Hus. Now, what was the environment in which he was born? What was going on in the 16th century? Well, in the 16th century, the church was in great need of reform. Many abuses had crept into its life. Abuses like simony, which means the buying and the selling of ecclesial offices. Nepotism, the practice with those people in the power and authority in the church would favor relatives or friends by giving them certain offices or benefices. Absenteeism. The bishop that was supposed to be bishop of this diocese never showed up in that diocese. A pluralism, where one bishop or one man is given several dioceses. And what does that mean? You, they would get 
all the monetary benefit from that. Well, many people in the church were striving and calling for reform and desired an end to these perpetual practices, along with the abuse of celibacy. Well, according to the popular story, Martin Luther finally got fed up and he finally nailed his 95 Theses to Wittenberg Castle door. That was on October 31st, 1517, and he did it to protest these abuses. This document railed against uh, those abuses and others, such as the granting of an indulgence for the giving of alms. It was a, it was a spiritual practice in the 16th century. And it was designed to spiritually assist the faithful in paying for their, not paying for their sins, in making up for the temporal effects of sin. They could do it by certainly almsgiving, and in particularly almsgiving in financing the rebuilding of the St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Now that's what the, the popular narrative says. He did this out of that. The fact of the matter is uh, it didn't happen. Professor Andrew Pedigree, an expert on the Reformation from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, says this, The drama of Martin Luther walking through Wittenberg with his hammer and nails is a very, very unlikely to have happened. The castle church door was a normal bulletin board of the university. This was not an act of defiance on Luther's part. It was simply what you did to make a formal publication. It would have probably been pasted to the door rather than nailed up. Much like, you know, the advertisement for the university outside. The church door was the place right next to the university where that was done. Peter Marshall, a historian of the Reformation at Warwick University in England, he even goes further. He said these theses were not posted at all, but rather that story was invented much later for the political needs of the people in the Reformation. And Peter Marshall makes that claim because he said the incident was first recorded nearly 30 years later. Luther himself never mentioned it. There was very little discussion of the nailing of the thesis before the first Reformation anniversary of 1617. And like a lot of things in life, we can make someone bigger than life by adding things to them. Now, according to the popular myth, it says that Luther was condemned by the church for his attack on the selling of the indulgences. Again, that's not the truth. The real issue centered on this. Martin Luther's heretical claim that the Pope did not have the authority to grant an indulgence. I'm going to get into that a little later on tonight. We'll examine it a little later. Well, after the uh, 95 Theses were posted, they were examined by papal uh, theologians. And Luther was ordered to travel to Rome to explain and then necessarily recant his heretical positions. Well, Luther never went. So the Pope at that time, Leo X, he sent Cardinal uh, Thomas de Bio. We know him by the name Cajetan. He sent him to Saxony to speak to Martin Luther. And Martin Luther was a pretty cantankerous fellow. He refused to recant. He obfuscated. He was intransigent. And it really bothered Cajetan. So uh, he went back and reported this. So then in the year 1521, Pope Leo X, he would condemn 41 of the 95 theses in a papal bull called Exerge Domine that was published in, excuse me, July of 1520. What did Martin Luther do? He responded to that papal bull by publishing a work entitled Against the Excurgable Bull of Antichrist. Not too nice to call the Pope that, huh? And in it, he said that the purpose of the papal bull was to compel men to deny God and to worship the devil. And then later that year, Martin Luther would publish his three famous treatises, which formed the foundations of his teaching. Sola Fide, Sola Scriptura, Sola Gratia. And also in these theses, Martin Luther called for the German nobility to rise up against the church and separate herself from Rome and the Holy Roman Emperor, by creating an independent national church. He went on to argue that the sacramental system of the church was designed by the Pope and the clergy to literally enslave the Christian people. Moreover, he went on to say that the man did not have a free will. He was not endowed with a free will, but rather could only choose evil due to the effects of original sin, which, according to Martin Luther, 
totally corrupted human nature to the point of depravity. See, this is kind of a rejection of his own interior struggle. That's how he came up with his theory of justification by faith. We're saved by faith alone. And his uh, teaching about justification is different than the Catholic Church. Catholic Church says we are born in a state of original sin. The penalty of original sin, the lack of God's supernatural grace is washed away in or by the waters of baptism. But we retain certain residual weaknesses due to original sin, like the darkening of the intellect, the weakness of our will, the confusion of our emotions. And those are the things that make us liable to fall back into sin. By the way, that's why our Lord Jesus gave us the sacrament of confession, to be healed of those sins after baptism. But Martin Luther said that it was impossible for men to do anything, that grace didn't literally enter our souls and transfigure us from the inside out. For him, grace literally only covered our sinfulness. And he often said we were like a snow-covered dunghill. God the Father looks at the merits that Jesus won, the act of his salvation. Those merits from the cross are like snow that covers us. Inside, we're still perpetually corrupt. But God only looks at the snow covering the purity of his son's action. It's different than what we believe. We believe that by cooperating with grace, we can be transfigured. And we have the testimony of that in our, in our, um, in our great sin, these saints, the communion saints. Martin Luther also viewed the church as the whore of Babylon and the pope as the Antichrist. You see a lot of this language, by the way, in some of these many anti-Catholic publications. Jack Chick was famous for these, but there was others. You can find a book called Roman Catholicism by Lorraine Bettner, and he, uh, he just regurgitates a lot of what Martin Luther did some 500 years before. A year later, in 1521, Martin Luther wrote another work called On Monastic Vows, and this ultimately led many, many monks and nuns to leave the, semin- uh, the monasteries and the convents. And Luther himself personally helped 12 nuns escape from their convent. Eventually, he married one of them, Catherine von Bora. And he married her and rejected his priestly celibacy to, he said, despite the Pope and also to please his father. Again, that symbiotic relationship between his father and God the Father keeps playing out through his life. Luther's writings did something. It tapped into the German nobility's resentment of the church and the Holy Roman Empire and the meddling in their affairs. And Luther's writings, it fueled their desire to wrest from the church whatever temporal power and temporal wealth that they could. Ultimately, if you study history, his writings produced great violence in Germany. The peasants rebelled in the year 1525. Urged by the nobles who protected Martin Luther, Martin Luther wrote a pamphlet against the murderous, thieving hordes of peasants. And in that document, he exhorted the nobility to kill the rebels. They had divine authority to kill the, uh, to kill the uh, peasants. And they did. Over 130,000 were murdered. Toward the end of his life, Martin Luther also wrote a treatise entitled On the Jews and Their Lives, which he advocated an eight-point plan to get rid of all the Jews in Germany. His last work against the pontificate at Rome founded by the devil, it contained his ultimate deep belief in the evil of the papacy and the need of its complete eradication. In January of 1546, Martin Luther contracted an illness that he blamed on the fact that he passed through a town of Jews, and the next month he suffered a stroke and he died at the age of 66. That's a brief history of Martin Luther's life. Let's cover the four myths that arisen in around Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation. And the first one is this. The Catholic Church, especially the papacy, was so corrupt and had strayed so far from the beliefs and practice of the early church that it had to be entirely replaced. And Martin Luther led the charge against this corrupt church and restored authentic Christian faith. Now the fact is, brothers and sisters, when you read history, it's certainly true that the church of Luther's time was in need of reform, as it is to some degree in every generation. One of the great lines that goes with the church is semper reformandi, 
some two Latin phrases, always in need of reform or always reforming. And we know that. That's why we go through penitential seasons like Advent and Lent. For what reason? We know that all of us need to reform. If we're not moving forward, we're coming backwards, sliding backwards. That's why we have these continual seasons to remind us we must be moving forward actively or we're sliding backwards. Well, the church is only a bigger part of you and me, huh? So the question is whether, is whether was the church so corrupt as Martin Luther held that it was beyond reform from within? <clears throat> now, to understand this, you have to go back a little bit in time. The two centuries immediately preceding the 16th century the century of the Reformation, they were punctuated with all kinds of disasters, both in and outside the church. Disasters that sowed the remote seeds of the Reformation. For example, the Hundred Year War that ran from 1337 to 1453. It actually lasted 116 years. I don't know why they call it a Hundred Year War. But anyway, it was between the two great powers, England and France, and it literally sapped all kinds of economic energy, cultural energy from uh, those two countries, especially France, which formerly had been the center of European thought and culture. Then, early in the 14th century, there was a climate change that brought debilitating uh, famines to the continent of Europe. Then those famines were followed by the greatest pandemic known to humanity at that time, and that was the bubonic plague, or the Black Death, literally wiped out a third to half the population of Europe. And it brought, that death, Black Death brought social discord and the decline in morals. Why was that? Because not only was there a loss of quantity of priests and religious, but also quality of those people who took care of the the common person, educated them. The good, holy monks and priests stayed with their people, cared for them in sickness. They contracted the the disease and they died. The unfaithful ones took to the hills, played it safe, and when the plague had left, they came back and they began to serve the people. But not only they were underserved by their lack of zeal and the lack of education, so it was a great loss because of that. The proximate seeds of the 16th century Reformation were sown in the 14th century when the church was divided by two great significant events. Number one was the Avignon Papacy. that went from 1309 to 1378. The second was what we call the Great Western Schism that went from 1378 to 1417. The papacy, and hence the church, went through crisis after crisis during this dark period. How'd the crisis start? Well, it started with a bitter quarrel between Pope Boniface VIII, who wasn't one of the shining examples of the papacy, and the French crown. Over what issue? The taxation of the clergy. Well, this confrontation led to a meeting, which turned out to be a confrontation between the Pope, a French delegation, and the Pope's Italian political enemies. Well, in that encounter, the Pope was physically roughed up pretty badly, and it really shook him, and he took off and went back to Rome, and he died shortly after that incident. Well, the next Pope who was elected was Clement V. He was a Frenchman. So what did he do? He decided to stay in France, in Avignon, which is kind of in southeastern France. He established the papal court there under the pressure of Philip IV, who was called Philip the Fair. Now, you can debate whether that was a move. You can make some sense about why it happened. But the fact was, there's no getting over the fact that the successor of Peter had left Rome in Christendom and was literally scandalized. For nearly 70 years, seven successive popes resided in Avignon, France. And this absence from Rome is sometimes referred as the Babylonian captivity of the papacy. Well, as long as the popes were living in Avignon and not in their diocese, namely their home diocese of Rome, well, what were the popes guilty of? The, uh, the abuse of absenteeism, when the pope or the bishop is not present to his own diocese. 
Well, in 1377, Chris is done rejoiced because why? To the urging and the prayers, especially of St. Catherine of Siena, Pope Gregory IX returned the papacy to Rome. But the rejoicing was only short-lived because that very end of that year, Pope Gregory IX would die. Then his successor was elected. It was Urban VI. The problem was this. The cardinals who had elected Urban the fifth, sixth, later came out and said they were compelled by the Roman mobs to do that. They were frightened for their lives so that that election was not valid. So in turn, those cardinals went to another place and they elected a new pope, Clement the seventh. And what did Clement the seventh do? He immediately raised an army. He went and attacked Urban in Rome. Then Clement the seventh, what did he do? He returned to Avignon and set up his headquarters there. This became the beginning of what we call the Great Western Schism. You know, although the church throughout history suffered, has suffered from anti-popes, people claiming to be pope and weren't, this situation was much different. And I'll tell you why. Because the various Christian Catholic leaders, they aligned themselves with whatever claim it would serve their political interests best. And in the end result, you ended up with three people claiming to be the Pope. Now we know only one was validly elected to be Poped. But this was a great crisis. The Great Western Schism was resolved at the Council of Constance, which ended in the year 418. And you kind of think, okay, we can take a breath as a church. Uh Uh-uh. Right on the heels of the Great Western Schism came another crisis called the Heresy of Conciliarism which stated that the supreme authority of the church resided with only an ecumenical council, apart from or even against papal authority. Why was that? Well, because it was a council that resolved the Great Western Schism, huh? The Council of Council. It took another council called the Council of Basel to resolve that crisis. But the fact is, the Great Western Schism and and the heresy of conciliarism it only further diminished the respect for the papacy. That office that Jesus established to be this very symbol and the, if you want to say, the catalyst for unity in the church. Now, there were other factors going on at the same time in this century, and they included these things, the rise of nationalism. See, what's happening now in throughout Europe is different people, different groups of people are assuming power, there's less and less control by the Holy Roman Emperor, they want to separate, create their own fiefdoms. So temporary rulers wanted to assert more independence from the church and from the Holy Roman Emperor. Wealthy families and rulers were frustrated with the church's teachings on such things as usury, charging interest on loans, and oftentimes excessive interest, and the prohibition of Sunday labor. And secular rulers, they resented the heavy burden of taxes levied on them by the church and their domains in order to support the papacy, the papal court, and the Roman curia. And then, as mentioned before, you keep having these ecclesiastical abuses such as nepotism, simony, absenteeism, pluralism. They keep resurfacing. And finally, also, the fact that many priests and monks were abusing their vow of chastity. So the seeds for the 16th century uh, Reformation, they were sown in the crisis of the previous two centuries. But the Protestant Reformation succeeded because of four major factors. Number one, I mentioned it just a few moments earlier, the growing nationalism, particularly of Germany and its constitution. You gotta remember that Germany did not exist as a unified country in the 16th century. That only happened in the late 19th century. In the 16th century, what was Germany? It was just a collection of several hundred independent territorials, nominally nominally led by the Emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. That time was Charles V. There was a deep resentment of papal authority and outside influence that was rampant and growing in uh, these territories. 
The number two factor was this. Remember, on the other side of the world, what's happening? The Ottoman Turks have risen in power, big time. They've taken over the whole Mediterranean. They're charging up through the Balkan countries. They're moving up. In fact, they get all the way to the doors of Vienna. It was the second time they did that. They had did it before under Suleiman. Now they come back in the year 1529. Fortunately, uh, they were able to drive them back. But what happened was, because of the threat of the Ottoman Turks, who, by the way, Martin Luther encouraged, what did it do? It deflected Charles V's attention and all his energy from this problem of, of the Protestant Reformation going over here to fight the Turks. He gave them a lot more time and leeway for the Protestant leaders to do their, their work. Number three, the nobility ensured the success of the revolution because of their greed for church property. It outweighed their desire for church reform. You know, there's an old line you say a lot of times in politics today. Follow the money. Always just follow the money. I always tell people, I don't care what side you are. Follow the money. Well, that's true here. See, one result was that in every nation that turned Protestant, the first act of these reformers is, was they confiscated the properties and the wealth of the church. You've got to remember, the monasteries in these times were huge enterprises. Many of the great cities of Europe grew out of the monastic life and what they provided. They were recipients of many, many bequeaths by people dying, leaving their... That's how they got so powerful and so powerful and rich. So we're going to talk about next uh, week. Literally, the monasteries were the original bankers that financed so much of the progress in Europe. Before there was a Protestant work ethic, there was a Catholic work ethic. And capitalism didn't begin after the Protestant Reformation. It began way back in the monastic uh, monasteries. We'll see that next week. But the fact of the matter is they were incredibly wealthy. The first thing they did was confiscate all that for their advantage. And they made sure that there wasn't going to be any healing of, the, uh, of Christendom because it would mean they'd have to give it all back. And the fourth factor was this. The pre-Reformation heresies that had added confusion to the understanding and knowledge of our faith. In a few previous myths, I talked about some of those heresies like the Cathars, the Paterines, and other groups. Well, they were from the Middle Ages, but they didn't completely die out. You know, they weren't, maybe there weren't the Cathars who thought you achieved perfection by literally starving yourself to death, because that's what they believed. Well, they didn't have that kind of thing, but a lot of their ideas hung around among the people. For example, the Waldensians. Who were they? Well, they were a 12th century group of poor men in the area of France around Lyon that followed a guy named Peter Waldo. His actual name was Valdez. Valdez had a great conversion, and what he did, he gave up all his wealth, and he started to live a life of absolute poverty in accordance with the teaching of the gospel. Kind of like what Martin, I mean, St. Francis of Assisi did. Well, it wasn't long before he was joined by other seekers who were seeking perfection through this dedication of evangelical poverty of the gospel. Problem is, they went off the rails due to their general lack of education. And they often misunderstood certain scriptural passages, and they ended up denying Catholic doctrines such as the existence of purgatory or praying for the dead and other things. And then they tried to justify their existence by claiming some legitimacy of, of an ancient connection to the original church, which they didn't have. They forbade, for example, also the taking of oaths. And that kind of harkened back to what the Cathars did. They were so purified, so separated from the material world, you don't have any allegiance to anybody. Now, even though the group was excommunicated, their existence continued and their ideas went with them. And it kind of infiltrated into the common people, were picked up by people. For example, they, the ideas of radical poverty, vernacular translations of the Bible, lay preaching, they hung around and they were picked up by another guy named John Wycliffe. Wycliffe was a teacher at Oxford University. And Wycliffe, from his reading of the scriptures and his, even his translation of the scriptures, he began to preach uh, a heresy denying transubstantiation. 
Well, that part, that heresy would be carried, interestingly enough, by a marriage, the Bohemian wife of King Richard the uh, uh, Second, Queen Anne. When she died, her servants went back to Bohemia. And they, historians think that they took some of these theories of Wycliffe with them and influenced a guy named Jan Hus. Jan Hus was a priest of uh, the Czech area. He was ordained in 1400 at the age of 31. And he was really zealous for church reform. Now, he must have known, because he'd been educated, that many of Wycliffe's uh, theories and propositions had been condemned by the church. But what he did is he translated many of these into his native language, his Czech language, and he propagated them. Now, he was confronted, and he submitted to the authority of the church in the beginning. But the problem is, remember, this is the same time of the Great Western Schism, so a lot of attention was directed elsewhere. And conditions in Bohemia were both politically and religiously complex. Nationalism starting to set in. And Hus was very popular with his own countrymen because he was supporting patriotism, supporting national independence. So as often happens, religion and politics started to get wedded there. Hus eventually was uh, confronted and uh, he refused to uh, recant some of his teachings. So he was ultimately even though he was under the protection of the Roman emperor, he was arrested, and he was tried, and he was uh, literally executed. He was burned at the stake. Now, people debate back and forth, and I think there's good points in each side, that it was an unjust trial and unjust ex execution. But the end result was this. Jan Hus became a national hero for Bohemia. And again, the issue of religion being used by politics and vice versa, it led to more and more of this division. Now, during these difficult times of the 14th and 15th centuries, the church did make different attempts at reform. We have wonderful saints like Bridget of Sweden. She lived from 1303 to 1373. St. Catherine of Siena, she was responsible for getting the Pope back to Rome. St. Vincent Ferrer, very famous for trying to reform the church. They were constantly trying to honor and to support the papacy and to try to get the church to move back to Reformation. Also, great spiritual masters like Thomas of Kempis, who wrote the beautiful little small book. You can still read it. It's a spiritual classic, The Imitation of Christ, calling people, but particularly clergy, back to a holy life. So there were different attempts, but they didn't take much traffic until the year 1512, Pope Julius II finally convened the Fifth Lateran Council. And it was called specifically to address the abuses within the church. So it was a great start, but unfortunately what happened, Pope Julius died soon after the council began. His successor, Leo X, well, he was more interested in ruling like a secular prince than implementing the council's reform decrees. Oh, he continued the council, did a few things, but what could have been a great spearhead for a conversion or reform of the church kind of started petering out. Now, it's eerily coincidental that these sessions of the Fifth Lateran Council wound up in what? 1517, just a few months before what? Martin Luther would break onto the scene. Certainly there are these abuses, but here's a church trying to to reform itself, trying to push forward this reform, but it's reached kind of some, uh, some roadblocks. So the end result was that the conciliar reforms were just too little too late. And Martin Luther began his revolution seven months later, uh, right after the council ended. So the fact was there was a great general sense in the church before the Protestant Reformation, as there have been many times before in the history of the church, that some things needed to be fixed. They were out of kilter. But the fact of the matter, there was no trace of a broad consensus among all the pre-Reformation Catholics for a dismantling of the Catholic Church and a creation of a whole new institution. Sadly, it would take the Reformation and then the consequent Council of Trent, the famous council, to take up the Protestant challenge to do exactly that, to start this reform. So. The real story is this. There's no doubt that the church was in need of reform in many areas in its life in the 16th century. 
But the notion that it was so thoroughly corrupt and only a complete revolution could fix it, well, that's a Protestant myth aimed at justifying the Reformers' cleaving of Christendom. The Church tried to reform itself long before Luther and Calvin, but poor leadership from the papacy, because a lot of them were just more secular than they were spiritual, more secular princes than they were shepherds of souls, they prevented that reform from taking root. See, true reform always comes within, and it seeks to do what? It seeks to preserve what is right, good, excellent, and true. Revolution is an external action that aims at destroying an institution and then creating something wholly new. Well, the leaders of the Protestant Reformation were revolutionaries who sought the complete destruction of the church, but they failed. And you know why? Because the Lord has promised us that not even the gates of hell will prevail against it. And I tell people that's why I know the church is absolutely divine. Because the things we've been through, it should have destroyed any human institution, but it survived. And not only survived, it thrived. The second kind of myth that I want to talk about is this. The Catholic Church sold indulgences in ecclesiastical uh, offices, and these abuses led to the Protestant Reformation. Now, that's the standard narrative that you'll hear about the Protestant Reformation. The church was so corrupt, corrupt to its souls, and it's so emblematic that it sold indulgences. Literally, he said you could buy your way out of purgatory or hell. And they practiced simony, the buying and the selling of ecclesiastical offices. And according to the popular story, this is what inspired Martin Luther to nail those 95 theses on the church door of the Wittenberg Castle. And the whole point was that he was rejecting what the evil of the Catholic Church. Now, as a general principle, it's best to review historical events to the eyes of the people who lived them and read their writings, rather than backward to the prism of our present day perspective and even our prejudices. First, we need to distinguish between official Catholic teachings and how those teachings can be misapplied by church sinful members, redeemed ultimately, but sinful people who can misinterpret misinterpret uh, the teachings. See, abuses of Catholic teachings don't invalidate the truth of those teachings. Now, by the 11th century, it was widely acknowledged that the church, as I mentioned before, was in need of serious reform. The papacy had suffered great interference from secular rulers, which at time resulted in as I said, less than ideal candidates sitting on the chair of Peter. Other abuses, particularly like uh, the discipline of celibacy, was flouted, and it was uh, very, a lot of sin going on. Simony was going on. Well, what was the church doing? Was it just sitting there? No, there was many attempts at reform. There was a series, for example, of 11th century, series of 11th century popes, holy monks who really initiated great reform including Pope St. Leo IX, Pope St. Gregory VII, Pope Blessed uh, Urban II. These men set out to free the church from the interference of secular rulers and to correct all the abuse of simony and to enforce clerical celibacy. But there was another issue that was also happening here, and that was the issue of papal uh, finances. See, papal finances were highly unstable because the bulk of revenue to the Pope and to support a lot of the activities of the church came from the papal estates. You remember, if you know your history, Pepin gave the donation of some of the large areas of, uh, of Italy was controlled. There were papal states, literally. Like almost, uh, I would say almost a third of Italy belonged to the church. Garibaldi, when they brought freedom to Italy, took those away from the church. But before they belonged to the church, but the problem is, Rome was always being, or Italy was always being invaded by all kinds of secular rulers, and they would take them over and take all the resources. So the dependency on finances were very, very sketchy, up and down. So to provide a dependable revenue stream, the reforming popes instituted fees for papal honors and privileges and exemptions. Monasteries and churches under papal protection, they paid what they called was a census tax. Papal fiefs paid tax as well. Unfortunately, these fees and taxes would eventually lead to abuse that they were meant to prevent. Now, as mentioned before, 
the 14th and 15th century difficult times. The papacy was in the hands of the so-called Renaissance popes who viewed themselves more as secular princes rather than shepherds of souls. And again, there was no question the church needed to reform itself from the abuse of simony, nepotism, absenteeism, pluralism, violations of celibacy. And many attempts were made to root out these vices, starting with the Fifth Lateran Council that Julius II called. However, the centuries of heavy papal taxes and fees had taken their toll, especially upon the German territories, where what's happening, the rise of nationalism, animosity toward Rome, and a decentralized political structure that created conditions for the cleaving of Christianity by the Protestant Reformation. The doctrine of indulgences was the flashpoint for the eruption of Martin Luther onto the political scene. You know, when you hear the word indulgence, there's no word that stirs up more misconceptions than perhaps any other teaching in Catholic theology. Those who attack the church for its use of indulgence rely upon and take advantage of ignorance of both Catholics and non-Catholics. Now, to dispel those myths, you've got to know two things. First, you've got to know what an indulgence is, and second, what an indulgence is not. First, what is an indulgence? Here's what the church says. An indulgence is a remission before God of the temporal punishments due to sin, whose guilt has already been forgiven in the sacrament of confession, which the faithful Christians duly disposed, gains under certain defined conditions through the church's help, when as a minister redemption dispenses and applies with authority the treasury of the satisfaction won by Christ and all the saints. That's from the liturgy, the dogma of the indulgences. What is an indulgent not? Let me just give you quickly seven common myths. Myth number one, a person can buy his way out of hell with indulgences. Brothers and sisters, that charge is without foundation. Since indulgences remit what only? Only the temporal effects of sin. Only the temporal penalties of sin. It can't eliminate eternal eternity one way or the other. Once a person is is in hell, he's there. The only way to avoid hell is to repent here in this world. So after death, one's eternal fate is set, as Hebrew 9.27 tells us. Myth number two, a person can buy indulgences for sins not yet committed. The church has always taught that indulgences do not apply to sins not yet committed. If you go refer to the Catholic Encyclopedia, an indulgence is not a permission to commit sin nor pardon a future sin. Neither could it be granted by any power. Myth three, A person can buy forgiveness with indulgences. Remember now, the definition of indulgence presupposes what? That forgiveness has already taken place. An indulgence is a remission before God of the temporal punishments due to sin whose guilt has already been forgiven. So indulgences in no way forgive sins. It only deals with the temporal effects or penalties due to sin. Myth four, indulgences were invented as a mean for the church to raise money. Not so. Indulgences, I'm going to explain in just a few moments, developed from a reflection on the sacrament of reconciliation. They're a way of shortening the penance of that sacrament and were in use centuries, centuries before any money-related problems ever appeared in Rome. Myth five, An indulgence will shorten your time in purgatory by a fixed number of days. Remember that? You do this novena, how many days you got after it? What is that referring to? Is it really referring to time off, you know, for good behavior, you get time off from your prison sentence? No. The number of days which were attached to an indulgence was a reference to the period of penance one might undergo during life on this earth. The amount of time it would literally take you to do penance. I'll explain that in just a few moments. See, the Catholic Church doesn't pretend how long you're going to be in purgatory, much less uh, in, uh, uh, you know, how many days you get it. It's referring to what would take you to pay off what would be. For example, when you go to confession, you're given a penance, right? And a penance is supposed to fit the sin. Well, in the early church, you're going to hear in a few moments, you were given really severe 
penances. And you didn't get forgiveness until you did the penance. And the penance may go on for years and years and years. And so what did that force people to do? They wouldn't go to confession for a long time. They wait till the last moment of their death. And that was the that was the, the struggle the church had. So that's why it began to look at things. And so it allowed for a substitutionary act to be done. So if you paid 10 years or 15 years of water and uh, bread and water sitting in front of the church in sackcloth and ashes, you could have it substituted by going on a pilgrimage to a certain shrine to ask for forgiveness. Okay. That's what the indulgence was based on. Myth number six, a person can buy indulgences. The Council of Trent instituted very severe reforms in the practice of giving indulgences. And why? Well, because of prior abuses. It says this, Pope Pius V canceled all grants of indulgence involving any fees or other financial transaction. This act proved that the church was very serious about removing any abuses connected to money, connected to the indulgence. Myth seven, a person used to be able to buy indulgences. You can never buy indulgences. The financial scandal surrounding indulgences, the scandal that gave Martin Luther an excuse for moving into heterodoxy, what it involved, it involved alms. Indulgences that were connected to giving up alms to some charity, some poor person, as a way of a substitutionary act for the original penance you received in the sacrament of confession. There is no outright selling of indulgences. The Catholic Encyclopedia says it. It's easy to see how abuse has crept in, among the good works which might be encouraged by being made the condition of an indulgence, almsgiving, would naturally hold a conspicuous place. It is well to observe that in these purposes, there's nothing essentially evil. To give money to God or to the poor is a praiseworthy act. When it's done for the right motives, it will surely not go unrewarded. So in summary, indulgences are often misleadingly described as granting to faithful Catholics the remission of sin. Not so. Indulgences are the remission before God of the temporal effects of sin or the temporal punishment due to sin whose guilt has already been forgiven in the sacrament. Bishop Sheen used to describe it this way. If you nail a, a, if you nail a nail into the wall, that's sin. You pull the nail out, that's forgiveness. What remains? The hole. God gives us the privilege to repair the damage of my sin, spack it up, sand it down, repaint it. That's what temporal effects of sin and paying for it is about, is making up the damage. Now, Catholics can receive an indulgence if they're duly disposed under certain prescribed conditions that the church lays out. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1471 states, the church is able to grant indulgences because why? She's the minister of redemption. And with the authority given by Christ, by Christ it dispenses and applies the treasury, the satisfactions of Christ and the saints to the faithful who seek repentance. So sin is a freely chosen offense, a freely willed offense against God and his commandments and against God and his na- our neighbor. God forgives the guilt of sin through the sacrament of penance. But justice, the divine justice, demands reparation. That is, the reparation of the temporal punishment of sin, the harm caused by sin. By the virtue of the authority that Christ has given the church, the church may assign penitential acts that will lessen, in Latin it would be indulge, or completely raise the temporal punishment of sin. That's where you get the word indulgences. So the granting of indulgences was not new to the 16th century. It can be traced literally back to the early days of the church. Remember, I told you just a few moments ago, at the time of you going to the sacrament of penance, which often is made in public, you confess your sins in public, you would not be able to get forgiveness of sin until you fulfilled the penance. And the penance could be very, very severe. They could be long and they could be difficult. So penances began to ask Christians who were in prison for their faith to offer up their sufferings and even their death for the reparation of their own sins. And eventually the church recognized the validity of these uh, vicarious acts and granted absolution to the penitents on whose behalf these sacrifices were being made. So during the 8th to the 12th century, 
Bishops allowed penances assigned in the sacrament of confession, which were often severe, to be substituted for other penitential works. As I mentioned, going on a pilgrimage to a certain church or certain shrine, which would be accounted as substitution for the days of penance, uh, the days you get off the purgatorial experience. In the 11th century, popes uh, actually granted indulgence for fighting in the defense of the, of the faith. The crusades were literally that. People would take up the cross, they would wear the cross, the crusaders, and they would go for what reason? They didn't go to get fame and wealth. We, we learn, if you read the real history of crusades, and I gave that talk and that myth, <clears throat> most of the families were very wealthy, royal families, and they lost everything. Literally their lives to go to defend the faith. But they did it because being a ruler, being a knight, was a cruel and bloody business, and they had chalked up a lot of penitential time. But by the granting of an indulgence, going and even dying on that crusade, they could pay for the temporal effects of their sins. Pope Leo uh, IX gave indulgence to German warriors fighting the papal honor, uh, uh, army against the Normans. Pope Alexander uh, II granted indulgence to warriors who fought against the Muslims in the Reconquista of Spain. But it was Pope Gregory VII who developed literally the theological basis for the granting of indulgences to warriors. He said there's two, two uh, purposes of fighting wars. One is revenge and acquisition of territory and wealth. The second is penitential, defending territory, restoration of property, and protection of the weak and the faith. And it was there that Pope Gregory VII said that one an indulgence can be granted for the penitential, uh, uh, penitential spirit of a warrior. Pope Blessed II, who called the First Crusade in 1095, he solidified that theological basis, and he wrote, Whoever for devotion alone, not to gain honor or money, goes to Jerusalem to liberate the Church of God, can substitute this journey for all penance. And later, Pope Boniface VIII reconfirmed this. Now, although the Church teaching on indulgence was theologically well-founded and well-justified, it didn't prevent the abuses of the practice. We know that because in 747, the Council of Clovesho in England found it necessary to condemn the practice of what? mercenaries performing someone else's penance for a fee, you know. So you'd be a substitute. It's like you get someone to go stand in line at Disneyland for you, you know. You come on in. Likewise, Pope Boniface IX and Cardinal Nicholas of Cusa, the apostolic delegate in Germany, condemned preachers who claimed that they had the authority to forgive sins for money. Now, another potential, potential abuse for the granting of indulgences was this the contributing to the cost of a building, either a public utility like a bridge and a church. Although this practice predated the 16th century, it was the rebuilding of St. Peter's Basilica under Pope Leo X that raised Martin Luther's ires. Because you see, there was a potential, there was a big potential for abuse because whenever money was raised under the correct form of indulgences, that you give this money as a substitutionary act for the penance that was given for your sacrament of confession for forgiveness of sins. Now I'm paying the penance by giving this money, this donation. That's potentially good, but the fact of the matter is the bishops could take a certain percentage of that donation. You know how that goes, huh? And uh, that's what happened. The situation gave rise to itinerant indulgent preachers, many of whom were Dominicans, would go into a diocese, they preach sermons on various topics, and then exhort the faithful to go to confession and request an indulgence for the giving of alms. Now, some of these preachers we know crossed the line and they prayed on the ignorance of the faithful in order to get more money. And one famous one was a Dominican named Johann Tetzel. He was the preacher who, by the way, was preaching in where? Martin Luther's home diocese. And Tetzel gave the impression in his preaching that indulgence for almsgiving could literally free a soul from purgatory, which was not the church's teaching. He abused it. Now, although he never uttered the words of a ditty that was attributed to him, which was, as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul out of purgatory springs. But the fact of the matter is, they actually conveyed the general theme of his teaching. That was abusive. 
But the point is this. Martin Luther was not condemned for questioning the granting of indulgences for contributing to the rebuilding of St. Peter's Cathedral, which could be legitimate. He was condemned for what? He was condemned for questioning whether the Pope had authority or not, and denying that the Pope didn't have authority to grant uh, 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 that indulgence, which is heresy. And that's what condemned or triggered the severe condemnation. So the real story behind the indulgence is this. The church always in need of reform. Throughout its history, there have been abuses of one kind or another, such as simony or abuse of clerical celibacy or, or nepotism and whatnot. Also, there was some abuse when it came to the granting of indulgences. Now, there's nothing wrong in the principle of granting indulgences for the giving of alms, even though some less scrupulous or saintly preachers abuse that. But Martin Luther was not condemned for criticizing those abusive preachers. He was condemned because he said the Pope could not give that thing. And the Pope, by the authority of Christ, has the authority to do that. Let's take a break, stand up, you can go to the restroom and whatnot, and then we'll come quickly to the last two of these myths. For the last 15 minutes, we'll cover a third one, and I'll, I'll pass on the fourth myth till next week, so we'll get to it. The third myth that arises from Martin Luther and the Reformation is this, that Martin Luther and the Reformers were the first to translate Scripture into vernacular languages which the church had previously forbidden, allowing then the common person to read the Scriptures. That's one of the main tenets of the false narrative about the origins of uh, Protestantism, is that the church prevented people from reading the Bible. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll see times in some of these tracts that I've read and very anti catholic literature, is that the church prevented people from... Do you know that they had the Bible chained up in the church? Well, why did they chain it up? Well, but when we did, remember before we had these modern phones, remember we had phone booths and phone books, and the phone book was attached to a chain, and the reason was that not because you didn't want you to use it, they just didn't want you to take it away for yourself. Well, the Bibles, remember there, they were... Before the printing press, they were all done by hand. They were illustrated. They were, they were absolutely priceless. So they were chained in the church to keep people from walking away with it. But people could come up and read those, those beautiful Bibles all the time. But these are the kind of things that come out of the Reformation that they chained the Bible up. And so this is the reason they, the church prevented the people from reading the Bible. Thank God people like John Wycliffe, William Tyndale, Martin Luther, and others who translated the scripture into vernacular language so the people could be freed from Roman tyranny and find the re, finally read the Bible for themselves. Well, that's just a myth. From the very, her very beginning, the church recognized the crucial role of the written portion of the divine revelation fulfilling its mission of evangelization. Remember, we believe that the Holy Spirit is the revealer of all truth. And that truth came down, revealed to the apostles in a two-fold form. Huh? First, orally, it was preached, and then eventually some of it was written down. Okay. So by scripture and tradition is the way we know, under the authority of the church, what the full truth of Christ is. The church was always interested in fulfilling its mission by preserving and promoting the written word of God. Once the church finalized the canon of the, of the scriptures in the fourth century, she continued efforts to make that accessible to the people. And the most famous translation was that done by St. Jerome in the fourth century. He translated the ancient scriptures, the Old Testament, in the Aramaic and Hebrew, and the New Testament, which was in Greek. He translated it into the language of the people, called the vulgar of the people. And that translation was called the Latin Vulgate. That was the most famous translation at the time of Martin Luther. The church wasn't against uh, translations and vernacular translation of the Bible. It actively supported it. At the time that Martin Luther was uh, living, there was already 36 versions of the Bible in the vernacular German. It wasn't already done. The church only opposed bad translations that could easily lead to heresy and misunderstanding. And out of that, because religion was so tied to the life of the people, lead to literally fights, wars, insurrections. The church was also concerned 
with the private reading of the scriptures that could lead to the incorrect personal interpretation of the scriptures. See, way back in the fourth century, the church suffered its first major crisis with the heresy of Arianism, where Arius, a Catholic priest of Alexandria, in his reading of the scripture, in the very bright, he had the scriptures memorized. He came to the conclusion that Jesus Christ really wasn't God. He wasn't divine. And he was such a charismatic preacher, he got over half the church believing him. It caused a huge crisis that took centuries to overcome. And from that point on, the church was constantly confronting false reading of the scripture. That's why it didn't say you couldn't read the scripture, but you couldn't come up with a private interpretation that was different than the what? The revealed truth of God that was contained in the Catholic church. That's how you challenge whether or not your interpretation is correct or not. By the way, that applies to spirituality. If you have a vision from God or some revelation from God, one of the things you have to do is discern, is it in consistency and conformity with what the church teaches? If it isn't, you're wrong. You might be mentally ill. You know, you just don't go on. And sometimes people think, because God spoke to me, I have to tell the whole world. No, that has to be tested. Private revelation is exactly that, private. It's meant for you to bring you some exaltation to help encourage you in your spiritual life. If it's meant for the whole church, the church will discern whether that's true or not. Huh? Well, that's what the church was against, not against people reading the scripture or reading it for, and, and get for their own spiritual enrichment, but it was concerned about the private interpretation that would lead to confusion, misunderstanding, and even heresy. Jerome, even in the 4th century, lamented this. He said, builders, carpenters, workers in metal and wood, Websters and fullers, makers of anything, cannot become an expert without a teacher. Physicians are trained by other physicians. But the art of scripture is only the only art which is claimed by all. Already he was experiencing problems of people misreading the scripture. The danger posed by bad vernacular translation and private interpretation of scripture became uh, very obvious in the 14th century when people like I already mentioned, John Wycliffe, professor at the University of Oxford, he wrote a book calling for the confiscation of all the church property, denying the doctrine of transubstantiation, professing the belief in the heresy of docetism, or excuse me, donatism, and embracing the false principle of sola scriptura, that the only truth we know is what scripture reveals. Well, that was from his private reading of the scripture. Wycliffe also translated the Vulgate into English, but his, his translation was condemned not because it was a translation into the vernacular, because it was a very bad translation. It had numerous errors. Even the King James Version, which is a beautiful version, has over 24 errors of translation from the ancient languages. You know, many Protestants and even many Catholics believe that Wycliffe is the first to translate the Bible into uh, the ancient Vulgate into English. It wasn't true. Thomas More... He said, the whole Bible long before Wycliffe's day was by virtuous and learned men translated into the English language and by good and godly people with devotion, soberness, well and reverently read. In other words, there were many vernacular versions out there and good ones. Martin Luther is also credited with freeing the scripture from its suppression by Rome by making it accessible to the people. Remember what happened? Post the 95 Theses. He's ordered to Rome. He doesn't go. He's condemned. At least 41 of the propositions are condemned in the papal bull, Exerce Domine. He is called by the emperor to the Edict of Worm to make an accounting of himself. He refuses to recant, so he is regarded as a convicted heretic. Now remember, heresy in the day was not just a religious matter. Religion and politics and faith and life are all wedded. That's why uh, rulers were so harsh on heretics, because it ended up wiping out their country, dividing it. That's what happened in France with the Huguenots. It's what happened in, uh, by the way, it happened Muslims against the Christians and Jews. And then it happened with the Christians against some of the Jews and the Muslims, too. The danger of keeping out false teaching, because it ended up dividing the country into war. Well, he was condemned. And... What was the penalty for heresy? Capital punishment. So what did Martin Luther do? He hightailed it to Wartburg Castle. And while there, he began his translation of the scriptures in his own version. He, Luther, was scornful of the Vulgate. For instance, 
he sneeringly dismissed St. Jerome's translation of the angel Gabriel when he greeted Mary. And the Latin version was gratia plena, full of grace. This is what he wrote. But German would understand that if translated literally, he knows that the meaning of a purse full of gold or a keg full of beer, but what does he make of a girl full of grace? I would prefer to say simply, Mary, full of love. And then later on, concerning the translation of the Old Testament, Luther hoped, and this is his words, to make Moses so German that no one would suspect that he was a Jew. He had a, <laughs> he had a great, great animosity towards the Jews. Other errors that errors he made, he was the one that created. Did you ever hear the controversy of the Catholic Bible and the Protestant Bible? Catholics added books to the Bible. You ever heard that? Well, if you haven't, you haven't been studying, you know, but that's the great thing. It's not true. What happened was there was two lists of Old Testament books, two canons. One, the more ancient one, was from Alexandrian. The Alexandrian canon had 46 books in it. The church, when it began its evangelization, starting with St. Paul, took the Alexandrian canon and its translation out with them to evangelize. Why did they do that? Because the whole world was Hellenized because of the conquering of, of, uh, of Alexander the Great. Everything became Greek and Greek language in all the major cities of the ancient world. So the places where St. Paul went, everybody spoke Greek. So he used the Greek translation to do his evangelization. We know that because in the most ancient text that we have, over like 300 of the quotes from the Old Testament in the New Testament come from the Septuagint or the Alexandrian canon. When Martin Luther approached this problem, well, in response, let me go back. In response, the Jews, when they were conquered by Rome in 70 AD, they had a council called the Council of Jomnia, and they, at that council, formed their list of books. And they had certain criteria, and they only had 39. That was called the Hebrew canon. Martin Luther, when he approached it, thought the Hebrew canon was more ancient than the Alexandrian canon, and hence he dismissed the seven books that they called the Apocrypha, saying the church added those. Didn't add it. It was always there. So he took, in his error, the list of books that had seven less. He also was the one that, to substantiate his sola fide, faith alone, he has substituted the word, we are saved by faith alone. If you look, it doesn't have the word alone. He put it in. These were errors that he made to support his false teaching. So, the church has always supported the translation of Scripture into the vernacular because why? It's charged by Jesus to spread the gospel throughout the world. The only way people can understand it is in their own native language. It only opposed the faulty vernacular translations and the consequences that come from it, heretics misusing them to create heresy. And that will conclude our night. I'll come back to the fourth one and the fifth one and the sixth one next week. Are there any questions, though? Anybody wants to ask any questions about anything so far? I'm only highlighting some of the major myths. Uh, there's other ones tied to it, but we'd be here forever. But I think these are things we got to know, especially don't get tricked on any of them, okay? Yes? Yes. Century, so to speak, and was that tied in from the Germanic, given that the crown and the German uh, bloodline? Yeah, they're, they're in it, but it, it mostly hin uh, hinged on for King Henry VIII, his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. He said it was invalid. He was in love with his mistress, uh, Anne Boleyn, and he was seeking an annulment. And the church says, We don't have the power. The authority of God says, Once married, always married. And because of that, he broke from the church. You know, he had been given the award and the title, Defender of the Faith. He had written beautiful writings on the church, but he broke from the church, and again, what was the motivation? Power and money. He took over all the monasteries and depleted them. And not too long ago, I read a very interesting fact that the monasteries were so unique, the monastic monasteries, the Benedictines, that if you, and the, the, if you were the abbot and the head of that monastery over there, you came up with an invention by one, end of one year, that had gone to all the other monasteries throughout Europe and even over into England. And that's how they advanced so rapidly in terms of technology. And I read recently that the monks in England, 
had developed a smelting process because this, to purify ore, you have to get the fire hot enough to separate the dross from the, from the metal. They had figured out a way to get the, the, the heat of the oven so hot that they could purify the metal and it would advance the Industrial Revolution by two centuries. But Henry VIII wiped it out and it was lost and only rediscovered after the Industrial Revolution. Kind of interesting. But the monks were ingenious people and uh, we advanced so much as we talked in another myth and we'll talk next week about what they did to establish modernity and capitalism and modern day banking all came out of the, the great monks, you know. And also great beer and most liquor. <laughs> so after this, you can go take one. <laughs> Thank you.